Welcome! In this lecture, we will introduce the idea of force. We will discuss different types of quantities, namely scalars and vectors. We will deal with adding and subtracting vectors. We will tackle the idea of the net or the total or the resultant force. And finally, we will discuss Newton's first law. Force. What is a force? It's rather intuitive in its definition. It is simply a push or a pull. You can even consider Star Wars as an example, as shown in this picture. We take this hand, so this person is pulling on a handle that's connected to a spring. This would be considered a force on that spring. The pull on the system, which is the spring, is the force. We have this person pulling a cart with a force in some diagonal direction. We could have some football player applying a large push to the football, and that would also be a force. Types of quantities. We have scalar and we have vector. These are the two types of quantities we will be looking at today, and we will use these throughout the rest of the course. A scalar quantity is any quantity that is fully defined by only a value. Examples are mass, temperature, speed, and volume. Conversely, a vector is any quantity that is fully defined only with both value or magnitude and direction. Examples are force, velocity, and acceleration. So let's talk a little bit more about these. Force I can apply a push or a pull in a specific direction. So force has some value in some direction. So it is considered a vector. Whereas temperature, if I tell you it is 30 degrees Celsius outside, I cannot tell you it's 30 degrees Celsius up or down. Rather, I could tell you that, but it wouldn't mean anything. So temperature is a scalar value. It is fully defined only by the value associated with it. No direction needs to be associated for temperature as a quantity to be fully defined. Hence, it is a scalar quantity. Let's talk more about vectors, specifically the notation. One notational example is that if you have a quantity, let's say force, since we introduced force a few slides ago, we can put an arrow over the F, the script F, to indicate that we are discussing a vector quantity. This is a perfectly valid representation. There is another way to represent a vector, which is simply the bold face. To use the bold font and unscript or unitalicize that symbol is another way. Both of these are acceptable. The latter is typically considered to be cleaner and is often used in textbooks. And it is the convention I will stick to throughout the rest of this course. However, you may see the arrow over different quantities, different symbols to indicate vectors in whatever textbook you are using. And if you are following along in conceptual physics, you may see something like that in there as well. And be careful not to be confused with the arrow and simply a line or a bar. A bar over a quantity often indicates an average, whereas an arrow often indicates a vector. But anyway, again, I will, at least in my lectures, stick to using a boldface font to represent vectors. Now in vectors, when using vectors, direction is indicated by mathematical signs, so positive or negative. What do I mean? Well, we can pictorially represent vectors simply as arrows. And so the direction is indicated by which way the arrow is pointing. However, if we're dealing with the algebraic representation of vectors, then the sign is indicated by positive or negative. Let me try to give an example of what I mean by that, and then we will tackle more in our actual example problems later. Let's draw a coordinate reference frame. We have x on the horizontal axis and y on the vertical axis. Let's draw a vector. Let's call this force one. Now the arrow is pointing in the positive x direction. And so if we were to algebraically write this, we would write something that is positive in the x direction. Again, I will give more examples later. 
Now, force two is pointed to the left, which based on the convention established by this coordinate frame that I've drawn is negative. So it's in the negative X direction. Now you can pick whatever convention you want when you start a problem. I've chosen this one for this example, and I will often choose this one for the examples we do in this course. You can also pick here another example of F3. Now, this one is more interesting because the arrow is not perfectly along the X direction, nor is it perfectly along the Y direction. It is at an angle, meaning it is partly along the Y and partly along the X. Now we can see by how it looks that it's kind of left facing along the X axis and upward facing along the Y. So it has a piece of itself pointing to the left along the X axis and a piece of itself pointing upward along the Y axis. What does that mean? It means that F3 is negative in the X direction because again, it's pointing to the left in that component and it's positive in the Y because it's pointing up. So it's pointing left and up. Therefore, it's negative X and positive Y. Similarly, we have another vector F4 at an angle. It is pointing left just as F3 was along the X direction, but it's pointing down now along the Y direction. So it's partially left and partially down. And based on our convention and our reference frame that we've made, that means it's negative X and negative Y. And we will see more of what this looks like when we do some example problems later. Vectors are added by connecting the head of the first to the tail of the second. Now in the context we're looking at here, we're talking about pictorially adding them, which is often very useful. Let's begin with V1. Now I've just chosen a different symbol to represent the vector. Doesn't matter which symbol you use, at least right now when we're just using arbitrary vectors. And let's add this V1 vector to a vector v2. And as it's already been stated, we take the head of the first and we connect it to the tail of the second. And that will yield, if we add those two together pictorially, this will produce the resultant vector, the total vector, the net vector, whatever you want to call it. And as we see here, this pink arrow, which I've denoted as V3, is simply the sum of V1 plus V2. And so you see the pictorial representation with the arrows and the algebraic representation in the equation. Now what about subtraction? Vectors are subtracted by connecting the head of the first to the tail of the flipped second. Now you know that subtraction is essentially adding the negative, and that's the same here. We're adding the negative of the second vector. So let's start again with v1, and we're going to subtract from it v2. But subtracting v2 is the same as adding the opposite, so we just flip the arrow. Notice that the arrow is flipped, so we have a negative v2, we're subtracting v2. If I want to add the negative of that, it is simply this. Now once again, we connect the head of the first vector to the tail of this now flipped second. What does that look like? It looks like as it is shown here. The pink arrow is the resultant vector or the total vector or the net vector, whatever you want to call it. So V3 equals V1 minus V2. Now let's do an example problem. So practice problem number one. Two groups are pulling on a solid block. The group on the right is pulling to the right with a force of F1 equals 10 newtons and the group on the left is pulling to the left with a force of F2 equals seven newtons. Now let's look at how I wrote these quantities. Notice that I did not write F1 or F2 in boldface font because I'm only giving the value of the force here. I've mentioned nothing of the direction, at least in the mathematical form. I've told you which direction the force is applied, but mathematically I'm only giving you the value and we'll show how that works in mathematically when we go through this problem. So now force one, now I'm using boldface because we are denoting a vector is to the right. So I'm using the pictorial representation using this arrow to the right. And F2, as mentioned in the problem, is to the left. Now what is the purpose of this example? Well, we, we want to find the net or the resultant force on the block as applied by these two groups. So in order to do that, we must establish a reference frame. This should be one of the first steps you take when solving any problem. You want to indicate to yourself and to anyone who comes after you to look at your work, which direction you are considering positive, both in the horizontal and in the vertical. In this case, positive X, which is the horizontal, is denoted as rightward, and positive Y, which is the vertical, is denoted as upward. And the opposites of that would therefore be the negative. So let's work through this. So F1 vector equals F1 value multiplied by this weird thing I have written here, which is X hat. That's how you would say it, X hat, which is technically a unit vector, but we were just here going to consider it as an indicator of the direction that the value is pointing. So using the actual value from the previous slide, 
in the wording of the problem, we see that this is 10 newtons in the positive x direction. So don't let this x with the hat over it throw you off. The hat is actually called a circumflex, but it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this course. We are just using it to indicate a direction. Now f2 is, well, it's leftward. So we have to apply a negative to this. We say f2 as a vector is equal to negative f2 as the value in the x direction. So that negative indicates that we are leftward because look at our convention. I say rightward is positive, therefore leftward is negative. So we must put a negative sign here. And we plug in our value given on the previous slide of seven newtons. So we say, okay, we are applying seven newtons, which is newton, by the way, is the unit of force in the system of international units. So we're saying here that we are applying seven newtons of force in the negative x direction by group two. So what is the net force? Well, I can write it like this with this bold face F and a subscript of net. An alternate notation is to use the mathematical symbol this Greek capital sigma in front of the F, which is used to represent summation. And this is what is used in many textbooks. I prefer what I consider to be the more clean approach of just using F and then subscript net. It's the same thing. You're just adding the forces together. So we have the sum of the forces, otherwise known as the net force, is equal to F1 plus F2. So let's move this guy up and let's plug in what we wrote on the previous slide. We know that F1 as a vector is F1 value in the positive x direction, and we're adding that to F2 value in the negative x direction. And this x hat is just an indicator of the direction. We can pull that out. And now we plug in the values that we were given in the problem statement. We have 10 newtons minus seven newtons. This gives us the value that we're looking for. We have three newtons and we're left with an x hat. No negative signs here. So what does this tell us? How do we interpret this? The net force is three newtons in the positive x direction, also known as to the right, based on the convention that we established at the very beginning. Let's do another problem. A block at rest is pulled rightward with a force of F1 equals six newtons and upward with a force of F2 equals 15 newtons. So F1 is pulling to the right. F2 is a vector is pulling up. Now the question is, what is the total magnitude of the force applied to the block? Let's move that over. Let's establish a reference frame just as we have in all the other problems. We're indicating here the same thing we did before, where rightward is positive x and upward is positive y, and the opposites of those are the negative. So vector f1 equals the value f1 in the x direction. Again, it's positive because it's pulling to the right, and we have established that rightward is indeed positive six newtons in the x direction. And vector F2 is F2 in the y direction, which is 15 newtons in the positive y direction. So what is our net force? I'm using a different color to make things hopefully a little bit easier to see. The net force is again the sum of these two vectors. But notice that they are in different directions. So what do we do with that? Well, we will find out here. Let's continue to write this out. We see that the total force as a vector is six newtons in the x direction and 15 newtons in the y direction. Now, if we were asked just for the total force as a vector, this would be the answer. So this is actually the total net force, but we've been asked for the magnitude of the force, which is a scalar quantity. So we have to do something else with these values. Let's see what we have to do. We rearrange our vectors. We add them pictorially. We have F1, in the rightward direction, F2 in the upward direction, and F net connecting the two vectors, adding just as we've seen already in this lecture. But how do we find the magnitude of the, the net force? Well, if you'll notice, this is a triangle that is here on the screen. And what kind of triangle is it? It's a right triangle where F1 and F2 are 90 degrees relative to each other. So we can simply apply the Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude, which just as a reminder, the magnitude of a vector is simply the length of that arrow in the units that we are using. And here we are using the units of Newtons because our vectors in this particular case are forces. So what is the Pythagorean theorem? Well, you probably remember that it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared, at least in the form that you've likely seen it. And you can say otherwise it's c squared equals a squared plus b squared, it doesn't really matter. So what is our c squared? What is our hypotenuse in this example? Well, our hypotenuse is f net, and our a's and our b 
is f1 and f2. So we can write this. f net, net squared equals f1 squared plus f2 squared. You notice these weird bars around the quantities. That is a way of representing the magnitudes of these vectors. So we can remove the vector notation. We can remove the bold face and simply write it like this to indicate we are simply now squaring all the values of the forces. We don't care about the directions in this particular case. There's a deeper explanation for why this works the way that it does, but we will not get into that in this course. So we have a simple algebraic expression. Let's solve for F net because this F net, this magnitude of F net is what we want. So we take the square root of both sides and we don't worry about the negative root because in this context, this physical context, we can't have a negative value of force. We can have a negative if we're indicating direction, but we've been asked for the magnitude. We can't have a negative magnitude of force that is unphysical. So when we take the square root of both sides, we do not want the negative root. We keep the positive root only. And we plug in our values and we get roughly 16 newtons. And so this is the answer that we've been looking for. Now let's talk about Newton's first law. Newton's first law. Every object continues in a state of uniform speed in a straight line unless acted upon by a non-zero net force. This is referred to as the law of inertia. Inertia is the tendency of an object to resist any change to its state of motion. So it's important to note that inertia is not a force. Inertia is a property of matter. Anything with mass, any matter in the universe, has an inherent tendency to resist any change in motion. If it's going in a straight line, it wants to go in a straight line. If it's going up, it wants to go up. If it's going down, it wants to go down. And Newton's first law is just a law of inertia. And he states it in a slightly different fashion than those before him, such as Galileo, but it is effectively the same thing. So again, Inertia is a property of matter. It is not a force. Let's look at this example. So you throw this ball, and let's pretend that after you throw the ball, there are no more forces acting on it. No air resistance, no gravity. What would happen to the ball if there were no forces on it after you throw it? Well, it would simply go in a perfectly straight line because an object will continue whatever path it's going unless acted upon by some external influence or some external force. Let's instead apply gravity. Now this is a more familiar situation to us because we live, of course, on a world with gravity. Well, the path will take a curve. The ball will take a curved path now because there is a downward gravitational force applied to it after you throw it. And so we see when a force is applied, the direction of the object or otherwise the state of motion of the object does indeed change. Let's take a different example. Let's ignore friction here and say that we roll this ball down the ramp onto a flat runway. If there's no friction, and therefore no external force, at least in the direction this object is moving once it's on the flat runway, what happens to it? Well, it simply keeps going. It will go indefinitely until some external force acts on it, until friction comes into the picture, or I reach down and I push on it myself. Let's take another look. This time, let's have the ramp end. So we have a downward slope at the beginning and an upward slope at the end. We are again going to ignore friction. And it still stops. So we ignore friction, but it still stops. So what is happening? Well, the ball begins to move upward. And if it moves upward, we know gravity is pointing down. So if the ball begins to move upward, it is now experiencing a conflicting force downward, which will bring it to a stop. Gravity will not stop the ball's motion while on the flat land or the flat runway because gravity is acting completely perpendicular to the ball's motion. Gravity is down, the ball is moving to the right or to the left, in this case to the right. There's no force acting on the ball along its direction of motion when it's on the flat runway. But as soon as it begins to move up the ramp, now it runs into some sort of resistance. So in summary, we discussed the idea of force, that force is a vector quantity that is simply considered to be a push or a pull. We discussed two types of quantities, scalars, which are defined fully by just a value and vectors which require both value and direction to be fully defined. We algebraically and pictorially added and subtracted vectors. We found the net force in two examples and we discussed Newton's first law. I'll see you next time.